Greetings, HPLD podcast listeners. A quick ad. This Friday, October 30th, we continue our random fandom trivia series online. And this week's event focuses on Freddy Krueger and Michael Myers from A Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween. Attend online. Find out more by going to bit.ly slash HPLD fandom. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash HPLD fandom, all lowercase. Today's podcast is also some older audio that was recorded with James B. Stoll, author and historian. James talks about how he landed and came to call Erie, Colorado home, as well as some of the interesting history of Erie. Enjoy. Welcome to Weldcast a digital project from the High Plains Library District. This project records, documents, and preserves the rich artistic history of Weld County and its residents through storytelling. The stories are stored digitally and are available to all users online at weldcast.com. Today's date is November 18th, 2015, and this is High Plains Library District Librarian Steph Myers, and I am interviewing James B. Stoll. So James, where in Weld County do you live? I live in Erie. I live in a community called Erie Commons. (laughs) In this episode, we're talking to James Stoll about the history of Erie, Colorado, but we're also going to tackle a bigger question. How does history become history? It's a big one for 20 minutes, we know, but we're taking a stab at it. Because James is a good speaker, and because his story weaves history into the present, we're using his story as a frame to talk about how what's happening today, what's happening in your ears right now, becomes history. It sounds more complicated than it is. Let's just get into it, see where it goes. We'll start with James's start, the story of how he came to Colorado. Can you talk a little bit about where you grew up prior to coming here? Glad to, yeah. I was born and raised in San Francisco, the one in California. <laughs> and um, at, back in the 40s when I was born, um, San Francisco was a pretty easy place to live, very comfortable. Uh, you could The kids would be out playing at night until the streetlights came on and eventually they'd go home. And people were not concerned about their kids playing on the streets. And I lived on a hill in San Francisco, so I went through a lot of tennis shoes and a lot of uh, knees and pants and uh, uh, from skate, you know, skating down the street, roller skates, or uh, um, just playing on the street or riding a flexi, which was like a, like a sled with wheels, and uh, having to stop it with your tennis shoes. <laughs> so that was, you know, living on the street like uh, on a steep hill like that was a lot of fun. I remember that. But then later on, we moved to another house. And um, as a young uh, a young person, let's say from six to early teens, I felt like I had the run of the town. You know, jumping on the bus all the time, going wherever I wanted, all over town. There were certain neighborhoods you tried to stay away from, but in general, uh, no concerns. I, I remember. 12, 13 years old, walking from downtown San Francisco through a park uh, along the streetcar lines and eventually getting home. You know, it was probably four or five miles. And this was like 10 or 11 at night. Never thought of anything. Would not walk through that district today. You know, it's just not, it's not the same. But, I mean, that was really, really great growing up in San Francisco. I was there um, uh, during the 60s, the turbulent 60s. <laughs> Went to San Francisco State. And uh, S.I. Hayakawa, who became a senator, was our president of the university. And uh, I had a chance to work for him directly in a program there uh, while I was going to school. And I was working part-time as a staff member. Eventually, they let me teach one class. Um, I I guess growing up in San Francisco, I would say it's probably, to me, one of the greatest cities in the world. And I certainly have a lot of nostalgia Born in, born in the in the or died in the wool, I should say. Giants and 49ers fans. I mean, I still like to follow those today. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic place to grow up. I, I wouldn't change my life. Let's pause for a moment. 
When we're talking about history, this is the sort of stuff that goes uncaptured too often. The things that are, well, normal. This next part is really important. How this all goes down is such a Weld County story, where things so often seem to happen by chance. What originally brought you out to Erie, specifically? Kids, grandkids. My uh, older boy, who's now 45, uh, came out with Sun Microsystems. And he lasted about uh, 10 years with them. Before, you know, they kept laying people off, laying people off, and now they're gone, of course. Uh, my other boy, and he came out in 97 with his, with his wife. My other son moved out here to be close to his brother, and he, he, he thought, and, and they both thought, that this is a place where we can buy a house and live, and we can't afford California. So they were both out here, and they were starting to have children, and uh, we were coming out five, six, seven times a year. And I said to my wife, you know, we're spending about $10,000 every year on travel back and forth. We get there, we take everybody to dinner, and we're doing these things. I said, why don't we consider moving? And every time we came out to look, she said, I can't find anything out here that would attract me. I can't see anything I'd want to live in. And we looked at houses, and we looked at towns. We were in Thornton uh, one day in uh, uh, December of 2005. Uh, came out for the, the holidays, and my daughter-in-law took us over to to look at a model home, and it was in Thornton, right near where they live. And I said, "This." My wife walked in. And she said, "I could live here." And I said, "Done deal." I said, "Do you can you tell us where you have this model anywhere else nearby?" And they said, "Erie." So we drove over to Erie immediately. And as we were coming down, then it was called Leon Whirl Parkway. Now it's Erie Parkway. As we were coming down in the wintertime, looking at the Rockies, I said, oh, yeah, this is cool. This is where I want to be. And, of course, then there were only 11,500 people here. Now it's doubled. And I'd say within the next few years, uh, it's going to double again. So um, we'll be up to 40,000 before you know it. But anyway, that reached me, and I said, I've always wanted to live in a smaller town, and we're close to Denver, we're close to both of our kids, and we didn't want to live too close to Thornton or Westminster, where my other son lives. So um, that's that's why we came out. We, we wanted to be close to our family, because we missed them a lot, uh, and we found a place that we could live. Okay, so far James' story isn't that different from the stories of countless others. He wanted to be close to family. He ended up in Erie by chance. And it's the by chance part that's really interesting here. Because all of this happened by chance. It's layers on layers of chance that ended with James doing what he did next. What made you decide to write a book about Erie, Colorado? That's a real good question that I've answered many times. And I'll give you the full, the full uh, explanation. Uh, being retired left me with a lot of extra time. And so... Uh, uh, having come out of high, um, higher education uh, as a career, the one thing I missed was research and writing. I didn't want to go back and research in my subject area, which was in business and the behavioral side. And I thought, well, what else can I look at? So something f that was new to me was the town of Erie. And I had heard it was a coal mining town. So I went to the library, and I said to one of the librarians, do you have any books on Erie? And she said, well, not much around, but you can read through these other books, and you find little things about Erie. And she said, why are you interested? And I said, well, I don't know. I thought I might do some research, some writing. And she hightailed it to the other room and brought back Carol Taylor, who was uh, your predecessor in your job. And um, so... Uh, Carol said to me, you're interested in writing, huh? I said, yeah. She says, right now I'm signing you up for a book talk a year from today in our uh, history series. And I said to her, you're a lot more ambitious than I am, but I'll tell you what, I, I will gladly show up and I'll give you a progress report on what I've done. She said, fine. Well, as it turned out, I showed up and I had the book already published. But it wasn't without a lot of anguish because of what the publishers demanded of me. And um, uh, they wanted me to come up with somewhere between 180 and 220 pictures. But it was a real struggle because uh, I didn't feel that 
that was what I wanted to do, first of all. Second of all, I wasn't getting a lot of help from them. And every time I would submit pictures to them, they'd say, well, these aren't good enough, or these, are, these don't have enough pixels, or these are the wrong size, or they're too faded. And very fortunately, my next-door neighbor uh, could do Adobe Photoshop in his sleep. The publisher didn't want to touch up the pictures because I believe it probably made them culpable if somebody came back with any issues. But I didn't have anything to risk, so I turned those pictures in that had been cleaned up a bit. Not doctored at all, but just cleaned up. And um, they were ecstatic. So uh, just backtracking a little bit, in um, it was March when I signed with them, and they said, we want your final draft by May 1st. In six weeks, they wanted the whole book. And I said, okay. So I got it to them in three. But, but it was a little tense around my house <laughs> while I finished the project. And that's it. <laughs> And that's, that's the story of the, the first book. The first and book. And then the second book. The second book, I, I sat around, well, that was in 2011 when the first book was published. And in January of this year, I said, you know, I really should answer people's questions. Say, when are you going to do another book? When you, and I, I kept saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to, but I really wanted to finish what I started. So I called up a different publisher who subsequently I found out had been bought by the first publisher. And I ended up playing some of the same games with them once I, once I realized I was with some of the same people. But um, I started, I, I made that decision in January. I think I signed with them in February. And they gave me a deadline, um, again, about six or, no, actually, their first deadline, they said, well, let's make it August. Well, I had everything to them and like a month and a half. So, and that was the same thing. Pictures weren't right. And, and I, but I did a lot of interviewing of people and gathering more pictures and a little different process this time, uh, going to people who had the pictures and then um, getting some explanations from them about who these people really were instead of guessing from pictures that we didn't have any history about. So anyway, but we, you know, it was all pretty good stuff. Um, so I got that ready and they said, oh, well, you're ready. Let's get it out in July instead of waiting till uh, the fall. So anyway, that was what happened. And so in July, we released the book, and <laughs> I've been on the circuit all the rest of the year, and I'm finishing my last one today, I think. <laughs> we'll see what happens after the holidays. <laughs> so. so based on some of your research, uh, my next question was, uh, are there any great stories or legends about Erie? Okay. There are legends, but I'll tell a story. <laughs> um, 1927, uh, there was a major, major incident in Erie that uh, was preceded by the Ludlow Massacre back in 1914. And I think a precedent had been set how the uh, military and the government and detectives and anybody who was a mine guard, how they were going to deal with miners who were striking. And uh, if you read about Ludlow, you know that it was a bloodbath down there. Well, when Erie miners uh, struck again, I mean, they've been striking for years, but when they struck again in 1927, the, uh, the militia and the mine guards and others knew exactly what they were going to do. They came up and set up machine guns, and uh, they put on hard helmets, hard hats, and uh, they had pistols and lots of weaponry that uh, they, they were ready for the miners when the miners were going to pick it around that, the, the mine. Well, um, on that fateful day in November of 1927, uh, the miners went up to the, to the gates of the mine, and the first day ever during any strike, the, the gates were barred. In other words, you can't come in today. Well, we've been able to come in every day. We're allowed to go in. We're allowed to get our mail. And uh, we were allowed to walk through and walk out. Well, they weren't going to let them. So you come in, we're carrying you out. And they tried to get in. It all broke loose. And the, uh, uh, the, results, the result, I should say, was six dead and scores injured. Now, because the... The mine was owned by the Rocky Mountain Fuel Company. Uh, a woman named Josephine Roach got involved. 
And she'd been watching this whole thing. She was sympathetic to the miners, even though she came from a capitalist family who were counter labor. Her father had been the owner of the uh, Rocky Mountain Fuel Company prior to her coming in after his death, just a few months prior to the strike. She was sympathetic because her studies in school had been all about labor and uh, helping the little guy get to the, you know, reduce the gap between those that have and those that don't have. So she, um, uh, and even during the, the strike days uh, prior to this one day, she was out there providing coffee and donuts for the strikers. This particular day, she wasn't. She was in Denver where she lived, and she uh, didn't know that this went down. She she got up here as fast as she could. Once she realized what had happened, um, she said that she, she was going to open up her company to the miners, and they could unionize. That would be the first uh, company to allow union uh, miners to uh, work in the company or allow, allow their company to unionize. So she did that. She lost nearly everyone on her staff because they were all pro pro management not pro labor so um, she allowed that to happen and her miners loved her they were her best marketing tool they would write buy from josephine buy uh, from the rocky mountain fuel company across train coal cars and uh anywhere else they could put out little uh, little uh, messages to people so they loved her they loved the way it went down uh she subsequently uh went off to work in washington dc she had known franklin and eleanor roosevelt uh, franklin and eleanor roosevelt and um they they saw a mover and shaker and so they uh, got her involved in various projects but she went on to uh to, I, I should say, influence maybe and help Roosevelt to come up with some of the fair labor practices that uh, or, or standards that needed to be implemented. Uh, she went on later on because she was such a progressive and such a, uh, pers- a, a, a passionate person with concern for people who didn't have much. She started Medicare. She started uh, Medicaid. <laughs> she started union pension plans. Uh, some of the, she was involved in social security, many programs that we benefit from today, and uh, that's because her passion, her passion for the little person. Yet she came from a pretty wealthy background. So, okay, that's a story. History. This local character moves into a big role and changes history. But how was anyone to know that would happen? How at the time could anyone know that history was being made, that a historical chapter was opening with a kindness, coffee and donuts? How would someone documenting the present know who they should be following around? Because there were many possible characters. Who are some of the great characters from Erie? From the past or present? (laughs) Because you know I am now. Both and either. (laughs) In the past. Well, uh... The first person who comes to mind is Richard Van Valkenburg, who I call the father of Erie. And I'm probably the only person who calls him that. But he's the person, he's one of the earliest persons who came here to settle and to help develop a town. He was not a farmer. There were farmers around uh, near the creeks where they could get irrigation. But here's a person who came in and, and the town of Erie probably was starting to develop people are starting to show up and and uh, think about living in a in a central location he came in um and was is credited with having built the first house in erie but i've never found out what house that is or whether it still exists he built uh, or he was responsible for the uh, building of one of erie's first hotels probably erie's first first hotel and he ran that hotel and then his uh i think his daughter ran another hotel in town he was uh, prior to coming here though he was a circuit preacher he preached from east coast or, or well let's just say the east not necessarily the coast around maybe uh, new york pennsylvania uh over to erie area in, in pennsylvania and that's why we're called erie he named the town after erie pennsylvania um the last place that he officially resided so then he was a circuit preacher all the way across prior he during just during the civil war rounded up a company of about 108 people and 
took them into the war zone, joined General Sherman, and he was General Sherman's chaplain when Sherman marched through Georgia out to the sea. And he, I don't know whether he was there or not when um, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, but um, he was certainly instrumental in a lot of that happening. So he, he, went, to, he went to work for the Union Army. <laughs> um, so he's one of the first characters, and, and probably the main character, because, like I say, he named the town, he was one of the original people here, and did a lot of things. And they say he was quite a guy. He could talk trash at, uh, at the bar with people on Saturday night and walk into the church on Sunday and deliver a beautiful sermon. They say he was a great speaker. Another character, uh, I'll give a, a family of characters, is the Wise family, because the Wise family was one of the original homestead families that came here 18... 18- 69, I believe. Um, and they set up a homestead. Uh, Oliver and Adeline Wise uh, came through with their kids, and then their kids had kids, and so th- their kids were here, then their grandkids were here. And uh, they were very much involved in Erie, but prior to that in the little town of Canfield, which is now a lot of it is part of Erie. Um, Sarah Wise is the great granddaughter of Oliver Wise, who came out here from Wisconsin. So she still is an instrumental person in the community and um, was responsible for, with her nephew Alan, uh, setting up the Erie Historical Society around 2007 or so. Another, and I'll just give you one more, and then uh, let's see, James Wilson. James Wilson, I call the man who built Erie. He uh, not only built the Methodist Church, he built many houses uh, in the Erie area, and and many of those that have brickwork, because he's not only a home builder or a builder, he was also a brick maker. So every time I look at a building in this town that has bricks, for example, the two-story on Briggs Street or any of those that run down Briggs, uh, the uh, the remains of a brick building around the corner on Wells, and a lot of the houses that have bricks. Uh, I wonder if don't those aren't all James's bricks, and if he didn't help to put those in there. Um, the house that was just destroyed last year, I believe, behind the uh, town hall. Those bricks were James Wilson's bricks. It might be in those bricks where we're finding our answer. What do we want to know from history? We want to know what of today will be history tomorrow. We want to be there when it happens. We want to touch those bricks before they come down, capture them somehow. We want to know what history is before it's history, which is kind of impossible. So how do we decide what to capture? How do we decide which stories matter? I don't think we have an answer. Not all of an answer, anyway. But James might. James ended up leaving California by chance. He ended up in Erie by chance. By chance, his outside perspective captured much-needed information about the past. But what if things had been different? If you weren't doing what you do currently, what would you be doing instead? That's a tough one, because I'm doing what I want to do. I think the only thing I would probably do differently, I would probably be living in Hawaii but it's too far away from my kids. But I've spent lots of time in, in the islands. I like the tropics. I like places where it's warm. I love the Hawaiian people. I love the culture. I love the music. So that's probably the only thing I would do differently. But I, I think I've spent most of my life... Well, I have a, a Hawaiian <laughs> phrase that I always say, the unnamed arrow never misses. It's just one of the things that's on on the T-shirts over there. The unnamed arrow never misses. So I've always sort of let life direct me, and I've always found myself doing what I want to do, and not necessarily having long-term goals, but just oh, this comes. Let's try that. Oh, let's try that, and 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 uh, that's where I've ended up. So where I am right now, again, and with volunteer work and doing the research and playing sports and working out and doing this and that. I probably would be doing those kinds of things anywhere I lived. But it's where I live. Colorado is a beautiful place. But on a day like today when it's windy and cold, I wish those were tropical breezes and that the palm trees were blowing and (laughs) not the leaves. Although all my leaves are in the neighbor's yard now. The unaimed arrow. 
Maybe the challenge in capturing history isn't about being right, capturing all the right things at the right time. Maybe that's impossible. And maybe the real challenge is stepping up with a quiver full of arrows and firing. All of them. They'll land where they land, and we're likely to end up with more misses than hits. But the worst option, it seems, is to have a quiver full of arrows, unfired and unused. So what's next? If someone is listening to this 100 years in the future, what's something you would want them to take away? A hundred years in the future? I believe I would want them to realize that Erie was very much, it was very instrumental in uh, developing workers' rights. Not so much Erie, but the incidents that occurred in Erie. And with Josephine Roach having come in and, and uh, worked with Roosevelt and made a lot of things happen. And I'll be talking about this today when I go out to IBM, is that all these rights that you're enjoying today in business, and people have been, I'd say, in the last 50 or so, 60 years, uh, it's really gotten better and better. Um, it's because of the struggles that occurred with people who were laborers in this country who didn't have anything and weren't given anything by their companies, and they stood up and they got rights. And those those rights transferred over to every one of us who today uh, enjoy benefits that we get from our from our jobs. And I'm certainly not a union person. I've never really been a, a pro-union person, but I see the purpose that they served. And collective bargaining, which people now engage in, came out of that. And it doesn't always have to be from a union. It can be a mass of people standing up and saying, hey, we need this to happen. So that's something that I believe people need to uh, remember and uh, keep track of. Um, I would hate to see people forget that Erie is a mining town or was a mining town, and it, that's how it really got started. And I don't think they will. I think that history will be preserved by those that care uh, and books and libraries and whatever. So I would hope they would remember that. What else? Um uh, well, that's about eerie. You know, in life in general, I'd hope, I would hope the world would be in a better place, and that they would remember, you know, what it takes to make it a better place. And you know, we're all sitting here as we reflect on what's gone on in the past fifteen years or the past few days, and uh, we wonder what what's the world going to turn into. So, hundred years from now, yeah, I hope things are better, and and, the, and that all this stuff that we're hearing about will be history. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Weldcast. If you would like more information about the project or you would like to participate, please visit our website at www.weldcast.com or call 1-888-861-7323. This has been a production of the High Plains Library District. <laughs>